Hi, this is Josh Becerra from Agurian. I'm here with Raza Hassan, the president and CEO of TimeSolve Corporation. Thanks for being here today, Raza. Yeah, great to see you again, uh, Josh. I love your new look. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I got the, the COVID beard going. So uh, let me tell our viewers a little bit about about you, Raza. So you, I said, are president and CEO of TimeSolve Corporation. You're a, a Iowa State Cyclone. My brother went to Iowa State, so oh, uh, you were uh, you did a, a bachelor in science, aerospace engineering, and then uh, a master's in electrical engineering. But then you shifted to uh, MBA strategic in strategic management and marketing from the U of M. And so I think that those are some really cool, uh, interesting combination of skills that you bring. Um, Time Solve, for those of you who don't know, is a time and expense tracking and billing software. Uh, it's primarily used by lawyers and law firms, but I know that it's available and a lot of people use it for expense tracking and billing in other professions as well. Um, what I think is great and like admirable about what you've done, Raza, is uh, this SaaS billing solution. You've been working on it since I think 1999. That was like before we talked about SaaS. Uh, so yeah, it's just just amazing. Been, it's amazing yeah. that you've been doing this. No, thanks. Yeah, sorry to just to interject. I, I guess I was uh, time solved started by Thomson Reuters or one of their divisions uh, about that time frame, but I didn't become part of it until 2006. Got it. Cool. So um, you have clients now in like 30 plus countries as well, right? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's cool. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the funniest stories I have about uh, my relationship with Raza is how we met. I, I'm sure you remember <laughs> this. Uh, we were. Yeah. Standing in line, we were at a like a conference where the the men's bathroom to the men's was like you know a mile long, and there were very few women at the conference, and so there weren't very many. And we were joking about, well, maybe we could just skip into the women's, and uh, we almost decided to be uh, pull the trigger on that. And then somebody walked out of the uh, a woman walked out of the ladies' room, and we we're like, no, let's not let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yep so, we were the two rebels there so yeah that was that was good fun and so we've kept in touch ever since and had some coffee and i've been following time solve um so prior to that you were a product manager and uh at a number of different companies so can you talk a little bit then about the um the inspiration for time solve or how you came on board uh in 2006 or the relationship sure. with thompson writers yeah so i guess i'll give you a little bit more history um uh, growing up i thought i was gonna be just a you know hardcore engineer and, yeah um uh, but later on after I did my master's and i started to work uh, it seemed like people just would not pay attention to anything I would suggest. And they'd say, oh, you're an engineer. You don't know this finance, marketing. So I said, okay, I got to close that gap so people can listen to me. Yeah. And um, as, you know, with that kind of getting felt like uh, not getting attention and pushed back to my cube, I said, okay, I'm going to go through the MBA program at the U here, uh, which turned out to be a big, you know, positive thing for my life. Uh, because then uh, during the MBA program, I, I mean, I finished in 1998 and uh, I learned about the internet. And uh -huh. when I learned about the internet, I said, wow, this is going to change the life of everybody. And I'm, I'm just going to not you know, do what I was doing. I used to develop software for flight simulators, and then I used to do yeah. uh, planning for uh, Northwest Airlines uh, in terms of uh, hiring pilots and forecasting, things like that. But when I learned about the internet, I said, this is going to change the world, and I don't want to do anything else, okay? This is where I'm going to bet my life. Yeah. So that's where I switched into this product marketing, product management jobs, and luckily, 
either you know some of these were consulting positions some of them uh, laid us off or you know either they didn't like me or i didn't like them so i kept moving around and i yeah. did a lot of things because of that then finally i was at thomson reuters and timesol was one of their products and they were trying to figure out if it should be moved from it was originally from la area to here in egan minnesota and my job was to figure out okay if this is a good opportunity or what to do with it and yeah. i saw an opportunity at that point you know that internet is going to be the dominant you know application platform but uh, i think uh, thomson was not clear uh the on the future of it at that point um, maybe uh, i shouldn't use the word thompson maybe you know just a few people i was dealing with because i think yeah. as a company they understand that uh so i was lucky enough that they didn't want to do it and i had to quit my job and then basically just make a deal with thompson which was in my you know looking back still it gives me goosebumps to imagine that me as an you know ordinary employee with very limited resources was going to make a deal with thomson reuters but luckily yeah. we were successful in making that deal and it turned out to be a great deal for us well that's outstanding yeah so um so in those early years then uh how did you kind of know that this was actually going to work yeah so i mean being in product management and product marketing i mean i knew there was a potential you know in this from just the ability to access information from you know different locations versus having everything on your uh you know computer and only restricted to working from the office sure um so i mean with that mindset again one of the things i believe in is that product you cannot look at it from an ROI perspective only okay you cannot say oh yep. what's the payback period that's kind of how you know the big company mentality is and also uh, that's why thompson didn't want to pursue this because initially it didn't look like a great deal yeah but, it wasn't big enough yeah it wasn't big enough and then you know again we put the typical metrics of ROI and payback period and IRR over you know a few years these things don't cannot be used to justify products okay i mean i think yeah. most big companies and this is kind of the mindset i believe that to take a product to market requires a passion and a belief and i believe this is where what i consider smarts beyond numbers because yeah. numbers to me is a very simplistic way of looking at anything i mean i show you the numbers you're going to came to come to the same conclusion as i would come to the conclusion but to me uh, the people i consider having a little bit of extra smart is to see beyond the numbers sure. because if you talk about numbers everybody's going to see the same picture okay yeah. so i think this is where i believed in it and um, i felt you know that this is the direction of uh i guess where the world is going so that that was the reason behind it that you know we bet our life and our life savings into uh making this deal yeah uh, so going back to your question okay how did it happen in the start and you know how did we feel about it and when did we see that it is going to work out i mean the again with like any business i mean there were a lot of challenges okay initially yeah. i mean we had this product which is kind of built on obsolete components uh, the servers were um, almost dying i mean this product was kind of a step child of thompson the people who were initially part of it had left the company and this was just nobody was taking care of it okay so sure so that those were you know there were a lot of challenges there well i do think that like you hit on something really important and that is that all of the well not all but of the vast majority of innovation that we're seeing is not coming from really really big companies right. it's coming from small companies and teams that are that have that belief in their product and they don't need to see like that ROI right away before making that investment so right. this is obviously a, a case like that where very 
early on in the days of the internet there, you had the opportunity to be involved and get involved and obviously pursued your passion. And that bet that you placed with your life savings, it's seemingly um, has paid off. So were there any kind of pivotal moments? Obviously you mentioned being able to even sign that deal with Thompson Reuters, right. that was a pivotal moment. Were, were there other pivotal moments or decision points as you look back that really right. I, you think make a, made a difference today? Yeah, I think there were multiple ones, so I'll walk you through each one of them. Okay. So first of all, I mean, I started out with, I knew that I would need a, at least some level of team, uh, especially, I mean, I had kind of been away from hands on technical work. So I needed at least some support on technology side. And again, I always believe in team effort where you have people with, you know, additional uh, thoughts and to bring kind of, skills. Yep. yeah, com complementary skills and kind of, uh, I mean, one of the things that fear, you know, I have this fear of not knowing if I'm doing something wrong. Okay. So I always prefer <laughs> that somebody is telling me that, hey, you know, you're wrong. So um, so I had put together a small team of a couple other guys I knew, but then we were having partner trouble. So one of the first pivotal steps was to get that straightened out. So we yeah. had to basically uh, make a deal with one of the partners and buy them out. Okay, sure. That was the first pivotal positive thing we did because prior to that, we were just a bit dysfunctional. Yeah. Because my, you know, two partners just weren't getting along and, you know. So yeah. I mean, I, oh, I, partnerships are hard. Yeah. And right. people sometimes when there isn't the, the right alignment, it right. just, it, it makes it difficult. So sorting that out, I can see right. where that would be super helpful. Yeah. So I think that's, again, you know, for other entrepreneurs, I would say, you know, make sure, again, if some decision has to be made that you go forward with that decision and not sit back, you know, dealing with it. Yeah, because it's, it's just gonna, you know, uh, I mean, the life is short and it's gonna drag things down, uh, yep. you know, and hold you back from succeeding. So that was the first pivotal point. The second thing we knew is that the product we had was weak and built on obsolete components. So I wanted to make sure that we use the latest and the greatest technology. So in that pursuit, uh, we found this platform called OutSystems, which is considered the number one platform on Gartner's magic quadrant for developing new web applications. And okay. not only it does web applications, it also does uh, native uh, iOS and Android applications that are integrated yep. into that web application. So we switched over to that. I mean, this was also a very big decision because it's a very expensive product. And for us as a small company, uh, we weren't going to be able to afford it. So yeah. I made a special deal with them, uh, which was based on revenue share versus their straight licensing price. Uh, just to kind of give you some more insight into, they said, oh, we can't give you a better price because we're selling to the US government and we're not allowed to give you a better price. Yeah. I said, well, they are the end users. We're not end users, we are resellers of your product. So give us, in, put us into a separate category of users where we are resellers and give us a better deal, which is based on revenue share versus, you know, the licensing cost. Yeah. So they created this separate program. And uh, I guess it was a good deal for that time when we were smaller because it was, it is based on revenue share. It's not as good a deal now. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> how, how long ago was that? So that was um, about, I would say close to nine, 10 years ago that wow. know, kind of started. Uh, with them. But that was, again, a big pivotal mo moment. Again, I wanted something that's going to help us compete uh, with our competitors. So that was a big thing. Then the, sec uh, the third thing we did, which is a pivotal mo moment, was that uh, we put together an advisory board with four people. Okay. And, you know, we picked people from different areas. Uh, I mean, a technology uh, person, uh, investment banker, a marketing person, and a legal uh, or a lawyer yeah uh, so we had covered all these areas that we deal with and that also helped us really kind of you know uh, grow faster uh and uh, you know spend money on sales marketing so i think those were the three things that you know helped us kind of 
become where we are, you know, have now yeah. good success. I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's great. I think, you know, anybody who has a software as a service company and is, um, you know, either small or medium size and looking to grow, I think there's some great nuggets of advice in there, like about the advisory board, about being creative around your partnerships and how you can, uh, you know, compete uh, in the in ways that um, ensure that like you are still providing like top notch quality product, um, even if it is like because you've developed a special rev shared relationship with like a, a really key partner. Um, one of the other things that I think is is cool about your company is that you are a hundred percent virtual, uh, and so you have people you know, here in the US, but you also have people overseas. There's a lot of companies that have tried and failed at this. So what do you think has helped you at TimeSolve make this like a viable long-term solution? All right, so yeah, again, this is another thing kind of I had been, you know, a believer in from day one that with the internet, I really, you know, sorry to, tell people this, but I, I personally feel that going to work is an obsolete concept yeah. now. Okay. So but now more than ever with COVID. <laughs> yeah. And then COVID has proven this. Okay. Yeah. And a um, lot of people used to question the way we used to do this. They would say, Oh, your people aren't working. Somebody made a comment. Oh, what if your people are, you know, the guys must be messing around during the day in the garage. Yeah. Uh, while they're supposed to be working. And, you know, to me, I think working at an office is less productive. Okay. okay. The reason I say that is every meeting in an office is at least an hour long. Okay. Right. And then there are more people invited to those meetings than necessary. All right. And let's say, you know, uh, I mean, if you have a meeting with 10 people, by the time these people show up and sit down and the conversation starts, it's another, you know, five, 10 minutes have gone by. People are chatting about their life, the kids, you know, sports sure. and everything. So there's a lot of social activity that happens. I'm not against that, right. but if it's not necessary, then I would prefer to avoid it. The second thing is there is a lot of, un, you know, invited um I, I would say interaction that, you know, somebody's going to come over to another person and say, hey, how's it going? And, you know, start chatting about it. And it becomes more of a social club, which yeah. is okay. I'm not opposed to that, all right? But I right. think sometimes, I mean, even when I was working, if I had to do something serious, I would, you know, work from home. Because right. then I could really focus 100% and not be distracted. Another thing which I find weird is that when you're around people, all right, there's nothing wrong with it, but I believe you have this feeling that other people are watching you, okay? Sure. So you got to, you know, dress nicely and, you know, just kind of watch for what you're doing. And while you're at home, I believe this is the place you're going to be most comfortable because you can adjust things however you feel like. Right. I mean, I, you know, uh, I mean, I have an office in the basement i love it i mean i have a nice view of the lake back here but i still have an electric blanket if in the winter time when i come here sometimes you know typically the temperature is like 63 degrees sure so if i want to make some myself warm i have an electric blanket i mean if somebody does that at work if people would laugh at you like oh you have a stupid electric blanket yeah right. a lot of people are cold at work okay because maybe they're sitting underneath an you know an a a vent, a or vent or something so I think there are a lot of benefits of working from home. The other part is the waste of time to go back and forth. Right. And it's just kind of a mental thing that, oh, now I have to go to work. So I get up. I, I mean, I, people spend time. Hours of their day. Yeah. Just commuting you know, and getting commuting ready. And yeah, getting ready. And it's kind of a mental thing. Oh, I'm going to work. So I got to read the paper before I go to work. I got to have a breakfast and all that. So, I mean, I typically, you know, I don't have to worry about it, you know, just get ready and get going. I mean, yeah, I think it's great, you know, and uh, what what I think is probably the biggest learning from for me is like you set this out 
from the beginning. Like you right. made this decision from the beginning. And I think, uh, you know, at Agurian, we really pride ourselves on our culture and our office culture. And we do um, try to restrict, like we try to make meetings very specific and goal oriented. So there isn't a lot of um, time being wasted, but we like the interpersonal part of our right, culture. Right. But that's what we set out to do from the beginning, whereas right, I think right. you made the decision to not do that. And so that decision is probably what has allowed you to attract the type of people that prefer that type of. Right. Work, right? right. So like being very explicit about it right up front has probably helped us sustain, be right. long term and be successful. Yeah. So I think the other question you had is how did we make it successful? So initially, again, you know, we're kind of, I guess, uh, used to specific thought process. So we thought, okay, we are in Minnesota, so we got to hire people in Minnesota. So we were hiring people locally here in Twin Cities. But then after a few years, we had some turnover because, you, I mean, uh, Twin Cities job market is good and people have other opportunities. Yeah. Then we thought, why are we hiring locally? We don't care. Everybody's working from home. So now we hire people from within the US from states that have fewer opportunities, prefer to hire people in smaller towns that really value working from us, uh, for from home for us, because they don't want to commute to, you know, some bigger city that sure. is 50 miles away. So I would rather hire somebody who lives in, you know, like Red Wing, Minnesota, okay? Versus, yeah. you know, Twin Cities, Minnesota, I guess. So it, it opens up the market. We can hire people from any place in the world. We don't have to, you know, pay the top-notch salary. Somebody is paying, uh, yeah. you know, in the Silicon Valley, things like that. That's kind of in the U.S. the benefit, all right? In the outside of the U.S., uh, initially, again, the mindset was that typically if you're looking for offshore resources, people work with a bigger company there and they provide resources. Right. The challenge with that is, you don't control and interact directly with the people who are doing the work and mm -hmm. there is still a lot of turnover and you have no control over their turnover because that firm that you're dealing with decides on if these people should be kept or not, okay? Sure. So what we change our model is that we hire people directly. Mm. They have to work our hours, they have to work on our terms and then you know we reward them accordingly and the other part is any business, okay, is only as good as their team. I mean, we are living in a knowledge economy, so you got to really leverage your people, all right? Yeah. This is not McDonald's that, you know, everything is predefined. Sure. So I strongly believe in taking care of our people, all right? I believe that is the only way to be successful. And, yeah. you know, if our people need something, uh, I mean, just to give you some weird examples, we have given loans to people mm -hmm. offshore who have we have never met because they were going to build a house and they were short on money or somebody wanted to put a down payment on a piece of land. Yeah. And, you know, so this was like unheard of, like, okay, a U.S. based company giving a loan to somebody outside, uh, you know, uh, who they have never met. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, That's these people can, yeah, they can run away without money if they wanted to, but, you know, I, I think I use some judgment and understanding that, okay, this is not what this person is in business for. They're here to help us and we are here to help them. Yeah. I think with that spirit, I think we have a phenomenal team, even though we don't date with each other. Mm -hmm. But I think there is a very positive culture uh, here yeah. at Time Well, that's outstanding. That is a, a cool way um, for you to make sure that, you know, you've got that that team buy-in. Uh, right. So I want to shift gears a little bit, you know, because sure. I'd like to talk about marketing and sales. So um, I'm curious about the marketing and sales activities that you've been doing and either in the past or today that are, that are working for you. Um, you know, I want to, I'm curious about like, I know you've focused uh, at, at least initially on kind of law firms and lawyers, probably because of the Thomson Reuters uh, connection there. Um, so I'm curious about your ideas around a niche and if having a niche is important or not. And then um, I'm also curious about 30, you know, 30 
uh, different countries represented in your customer base. So like, how did that happen? So just generally tell me about like marketing, sales, international sales, being in a niche, what's working. Let me hear it. All right. A lot of questions, a lot of information here. All right. So I guess I think I'd like to start with the niche. Okay. Okay. Because everything is connected to that. Um, Thompson, I mean, is a big company and they weren't really as focused on legal. Uh, when we took over, they had a small customer base, but it was still 50% legal and 50% everybody else. Yeah. All right. So the thing is for me, and again, you know, this is from my education that for a small company to be successful, right? Mm -hmm. You have to focus on a particular area. All right. And the, I'll share with you why. All right. The reason is, again, you know, for any business to be successful, especially on the Internet, you have to be the best in your category. All right. right. Category can be whatever. I mean, you can say that, you know, your category, uh, just to give you an example of a category, um, one of the businesses we came across is a website company that does websites only for plastic surgeons. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've so, seen some of these types of companies. Yeah. Right. So the thing is when anyone, a buyer is going to buy something, they want to get the best product that they can afford. Right. Nobody, even if you're buying aspirin, you know, your brain kind of says, okay, this is the better product. This is what I yeah. want to get. So when we people are buying software, especially when it's on the internet or any product, you got to make sure that you are ideally the number one player in that category so that if a customer looks at you, they say, okay, this is the best product in this category that I'm buying. Right. All right. The only way you can accomplish that as a smaller company, unless you know, you're Microsoft and you have a word processor, that's the best for everybody. Sure. So when you're starting out with, you got to create your niche. Sometimes it's not there. So you kind of have to figure out how to create it and then work hard enough and position yourself to be the best in that category. So the only way that I believe that can be done is if you focus on a particular niche. Now, that's one part of it. Okay. The other part is that by having a niche, you know how to market to that niche more effectively. Your right. marketing dollars go more deeper instead of just, you know, sprinkling across the whole world and not winning anything. Sure. So that's kind of, I think the other part is, okay, your marketing resources as a smaller company or as a startup is always going to be limited. All right. So mm -hmm. you have to say that, okay, I want to go deeper and have success because marketing is the most expensive thing for any smaller company all right? right so i guess um how we have succeeded is again we have focused on legal and hired the right people pretty much everybody that deals with our prospects or customers has experience working at a law firm or wow. has yeah. done something with the law firm in the past okay but most people we look for are the people who worked at a law firm because we want these people to speak the language of our customers, which are typically attorneys or office managers at law firms. So I think that kind of, you know, what drives that success, all right? Yep. So I, I think, and you know, we believe right now we are the best in the legal billing. We can do other things, but we want to stay focused in this area because yeah. we consider ourselves the best and we uh, have done, you know, a lot of effort and accomplished uh, results so other question you had was what's working in the uh, marketing world and uh, yeah. sales world so on the marketing one of the big successes in the long run is to be you know blessed by google and try to be number one in your yeah, rankings specific. right so we are now the number one if somebody searches for legal billing software we're the number one software vendor there are some, exactly. Yeah, there are some directories ahead of us. I mean, we're not going to be able to compete with the directory which has 
of hundreds of uh, vendors listed. But when it comes to vendors, we are the number one there. Okay, to me, that is a big accomplishment. It took us almost 10 years of constant, I guess, effort. You know, all the different yep. things that have to be done. Oh, yeah. So I think that's, that's kind of, you know, uh, one big thing that drives our marketing success. The other things we constantly, you know, promote is the ability to have our customer reviews. The word of mouth is very important to us. And sure. then other things, you know, social media, I mean, which are typically everybody's doing that. I mean, we do everything else to pay yep. channels and things like that. Uh, but I think the overall success is, you know, I mean, just, I believe it's the focus and uh, being considered the number one product yeah. in that legal billing niche. So when you when you started growing beyond the U.S., um, was that mostly due? Do you think to the rankings? Do you, or was there a lot of like uh, word of mouth and referrals happening? Like, how did the international customer acquisition happen? Yeah, so I think another thing, you know, the benefit of a niche is even though you know there's like over a million lawyers in the U.S., but a lot of these lawyers, even from you know outside of the U.S. meet in many of these conferences. Yeah. So, for instance, you know, there is this ABA tech show in Chicago every year. People come, I mean, vendors and other visitors, if, you know, they can, they come here and uh, attend those big, uh, I guess, events. Sure. Yeah. They also, you know, are following similar uh, I believe news channels and legal education uh, yep. networks. So once you penetrate one vertical, I mean the world is becoming smaller and smaller. So everybody's connected. So we have not really traced on how these other outside of the U.S. people find us. I mean we really don't spend much money as yet. Um, so we did have an effort for a short while, but it, I guess it was not successful for multiple yeah. reasons but in general i think we have had success just because i think these people that we are dealing with have had some connections in the u.s and other part is yes just on the being on the internet and you yep. know easily i guess found that they have come to us and the other another thing is that again you know so for instance strangely we have a big customer in vietnam all right uh -huh. but once you have one firm in a particular country, which is again, I mean, all these things I consider as networks, okay? Yep. So like a, a niche is a network of connected people, and then, you know, uh, all these law firms are connected to other law firms. So if you can penetrate into some of these firms, then they have other connections. So we get more customers once we enter a particular market. So I think that's kind of, I think, the reason that we have been successful is just, well, you know, focusing on the niche and you know, spreading through those tentacles. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, anybody watching, it's just great to hear stories about companies that start small, they grow, they're successful, they have like longevity, you're building uh, co the company and the culture the way that you want it. Uh, nobody is imposing this on you. Um, so just last question would be what kind of advice you might have for someone who's either started building a SaaS company or interested in building a SaaS company that that kind of has the longevity that you've been able to create. And um, so advice. All right, so I think a few things. One, you have to understand and make sure that you're creating a culture where your team members are empowered uh -huh. and they are committed and motivated. Yeah. So whatever you can do, you know, so my personal, uh, I guess, uh, desire is to share our successes with our employees. All mm -hmm. right. And to do that, I think, um, again, as many people as I could, I try to have them on a commission basis. The second thing is to have quick feedback. I mean, most companies have an annual review and then people, you know, it's just like a drag for the person performing the review and the person receiving the review. Right. <laughs> so our goal is to, we do this on a monthly basis. Okay. Wow. And so just, you know, quick feedback uh, on, Hey, how am I doing? What can I do better? Things like that. I mean, it's not like, you know, like a big forum and 
sure. five pages of information and people are just filling it out because the form is there, right? So that, that's, again, focus on building a team. Mm-hmm. The other part is any product is a collective thinking of an organization. What I mean by that is if it is just the thought process of one person, the product is not going to be as good as just the thought process of 10 people working together. Right. So create a process where you consult and involve the whole team in your product development. So that's what we do. We have a process where pretty much all these different people are involved in that product development process. So yeah, I am not, cool. yeah, it's not like, okay, I know it. And then, you know, our director of sales doesn't know it. Marketing guy doesn't know our director of marketing. I mean, these people are critical to even developing our product. Okay. Even Got though it. in other companies, they're, oh, you do your marketing, you do your sales. I'll do the product. It doesn't work like that. So you got to involve your whole team in that process. All right. And yep. Understand that conflicts are a good thing. If we have a conflict, my philosophy is that you go back and rise to a higher level to yeah. come up with a better solution so that, you know, if it's two parties that both parties agree to it versus somebody saying, okay, my answer is better than yours. So I'm going to go with it. No, my answer is not as good as what you want to see. Or your answer is not as good as what I want to see. Let's come up with an answer which both of us would say this is better. Okay, yeah, and we agree really to that. Like that. So go back, go back to the drawing board and figure out a better answer that both say, okay, this is wonderful. All right, a uh, few books. Another thing I would say is always, you know, be learning, uh, kind of nourish your brain because products are about what you think. A couple of books I would recommend is one is Blue Ocean Strategy, which is mm-hmm. you know great book. Uh, it's been here for a while. One of the newer books I think you know again I follow Simon Sinek. I think he does a great job. One of the books. It's called the uh, Infinite Game. Uh, I, I think that also helps uh, people understand how to have a motivated team and yeah. uh, you know not be just focused on small things and have a bigger picture. So I think those are the things I would say. And then finally, engage advisors. Okay, because you need uh, somebody else to bounce off your ideas, somebody who can tell you that you're doing something wrong. Yeah. And also empower your employees to do the same. So I would say these are the things, uh, you know, that are important. And again, just make sure you're going to win where you're going to play. But yeah. finally, I, I think another thing I would say is understand that there is no one formula that wins uh, or creates a winning product. Okay. It's the passion. You got to go for it. You may win. You may not lose. Okay, but the risk and the rewards are high. If you wanna yeah. don't wanna be in the risk, if you don't wanna take risk, then don't be in the product game. Be in the services game because then you know the risk is lower. Product yeah. is gonna be successful, or it's gonna be a deadbeat, or it's not gonna be worthwhile. Okay, because in the internet age and especially in the software world, only the winner wins. Okay, and then the, right. in the long run, like the Microsoft Word or Excel, or you know even the databases or the browsers, in the long run. Only few players that are going to stay. All right. Everybody right. else is going to get washed out. So you got to understand, hey, where where do I want to be able to, you know, where am I going to have that success? And I'm going to be better than everybody else. Well, I think it's amazing advice. I The thing that I keyed in on, which I think is so cool, is that when I ask you what your advice is about building a software as a service company, all of your answers relate back to people like you didn't talk about tech stack you didn't talk right. about like you know the 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 partnership you talked about your team you talked about your advisors you talked about getting input like what in the end i'm concluding from your advice anyway is that like the people the people are really what's going to matter and drive that success so I, uh, I really appreciate uh, this talk. I really uh, enjoy talking with you all the time, Raza. This has been great. Um, we'll be uh, posting this up on our uh, SaaS Scoop uh, link and, um, and also on our blog. So thanks again, Raza. I appreciate your time. We'll uh, sign off for now. Bye. All right, Josh. It's a pleasure. Thanks and stay safe.